Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hoop. And this is our regular weekly message. And today's message is entitled, Little is Much in the Hands of God. So please turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 8 through 16. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Arise and go to Seraphath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Seraphath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear, go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me, and afterward, make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, The jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty, until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent. Neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that was spoken by Elijah. No fuss, no muss. The widow did not question, neither did she object. She did not hesitate, and she did not doubt in her heart. But she only obeyed the word of the Lord spoken through the prophet Elijah, and she used what was in her hand. No matter how small, no matter how insignificant it seemed, she offered it. Because God asked for it, she gave it. So stop looking at what you do not have and start looking at what you do have. God cannot use what you don't have. He can only use what you do have. So don't worry about what you do not have. If you need it, God will provide it. But until then, keep on using what it is that you do have. Let me give you a little background. Ahab, the son of Omri, was reigning over Israel, but he was an idolatrous king. He married Jezebel, who taught him to serve Baal. Because of his idolatry, God, through Elijah, shut up the heavens for three and a half years. Elijah stayed by the brook where he drank water and the ravens came and fed him every day. Every morning they brought him bread and meat. Every evening they brought him bread and meat and he drank the water from the brook. But when the water dried up in the brook, God told him, go to a certain widow in Zarephath. And that's where we will pick up our story today. You see, Elijah obeyed God and he went to Seraphath. And as he, was, as he was walking through the gate of Seraphath, he saw a widow gathering sticks to go back home and to cook her last meal. The famine was that severe. In fact, the famine was so severe that she believed that after cooking that handful of meal, that handful of flour that she had, she and her son were going to lie down and die from starvation. There was absolutely nothing left for her and her son to eat. All that the widow had left was a handful of flour, a little oil, a little water, and nothing else. But Elijah said, make something for me first. And this is what will happen. You will have enough to eat for the rest of the famine. You will not need to fear. So do not fear now. Just do what I have told you to do. Look at 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 14. 
For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. This was a bold request backed by an even bolder promise. It might not seem much to you. It might not seem much to me. But when you consider that Elijah was asking this widow to be all in, to put everything that she had into this promise, I mean that she would have nothing left to go around if she was to comply with this request then you would understand that it was a great leap of faith on the part of the widow. It was a matter of trust. She had to have faith in both Elijah, the servant of the Lord, the God of Israel, that he was telling her the truth. Then she also had to have the faith in the Lord God himself to do what Elijah said that he would do. She had to have faith. It was so much faith coupled with so much obedience that Jesus used her as an example in Luke chapter 4, verse 25 through 26. He said, but in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months. And a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. God was asking for big things. And this was a very big thing. He asked her to trust him, not only with her own life, but with the life of her loved one, her son. The passage doesn't say how old this young boy was. It doesn't say how old her son was. It seems like he was young enough to still be living with her and not her with him. So he seems like he was still an adolescent child, a child to be cared for. But this is what I, I want you to catch. When God asks you to give something, he always rewards you back with more than you gave to him in the first place. All God asked the woman for was one meal, one handful of bread, one, one cake to give to Elijah to eat. But look at what she got in return. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 15 through 16. It says, and she went and did as Elijah said, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. Little is much in the hands of God. You cannot outgive God, for God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or even think according to Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20. You see, when God says do something and I'll do something back for you, God can do that. God can do whatever he wants to do. There's nothing that's too hard for God to do. And there's nothing that's too easy that God will overlook. God is concerned about us. Little is much in the hands of God. Like I said, you cannot, cannot uh, give God. For God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above that which we can ask or even think. I want you to understand that. Please Understand also that God did not send Elijah to, to the widow to sponge off of her, but rather he sent Elijah to be fed by her, and in turn, he would feed her and her house. She and her son and all that was with her would eat and eat good. The scripture actually says that her whole household, so she had servants, living with her, they would eat. If she had guests, if she had family, they would eat. She and her whole household would eat 
and they would eat well. Even though she only had a handful of flour and a little oil that she was going to bake bread for her and her son and then die, God had other plans for her. You see, sometimes we feel like that, like we're at the end of a road. We're in at the, the, hanging on at the end of a string, so to speak. But you see, when we get there, God has other plans for us. All we got to do is to obey. All we got to do is to hang on. Hang on another day. You see, if, if it was yesterday and she thought, okay, well, I'm going to not hang on anymore. I'm just going to give up now. It would have been too quick. By the time Elijah came, it would have been all over. But no, she hung on until the end. And then God sent someone because God is never late. So if you feel like you're at the end of your road, if you feel like you're at the end of your rope, hang on. God will come to your rescue. He has plans for you. Just like he, has plan he had plans for that widow and her whole household. God has plans for you. Hold on. You see, God just didn't have plans for her alone. He had plans for her whole household because they benefited from her obedience. They benefited from her faith. We benefit from others. You see, God says that he repays and blesses up to a thousand generations of those who love him. And he only punishes to the third or fourth. But he will bless up to a thousand generations. God is a good, good God. God loves you. God cares about you. Think about this. God loves you so much that he sent his only begotten son. He sent Jesus to die on the cross that you might live. God loves you that much. God cares about you so much. He said, cast your burdens upon me. Cast your cares upon me because I care about you. And God cares about you. He has plans for you. But I want you to look at Elijah's response when the widow advised that she only had her last meal left that she only had a handful of flour. She didn't have anything to spare. Everything that she had was gone. Everything she had was already consumed. All she had was that handful of flour. Look at, at what Elijah said to her. First Kings chapter 17, verse 13. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said. But first, make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterwards, make something for yourself and your son. You see, God wanted her to be obedient. I wonder what would happen if she had that scarcity mentality or even if she was feeling selfish that day or just plain acted in doubt if she just refused to be obedient because she thought that she would have nothing left for herself. We would never ever know what happened. We would never ever hear about that story. But since her faith was strong and she was obedient, the end of the story tells it all. She did as Elijah asked. She didn't hesitate. She went and did what Elijah asked her to do. And the flour and the oil did not run out until the famine had ended. And she and her household ate well throughout the whole time that the famine was ravishing the rest of the world. She and her son, she and her household were eaten well. The other widows that were in Jerusalem, they didn't fare as well. You see, little is much in the hands of God. All we got to do is to trust him. He will do good unto us. Because like I said, God loves you. He wants to bless you. He wants to give you. He wants to supply all your needs. God loves you. But I want you to check this. Check this out. First, we must give to God what he asks for. Or 
we must give to God what he determines is his. And through that action of faith, he will then bless us. But far too often, we live our life in scarcity mentality. And we refuse to open our hand and let God have his way. And thus, we miss out on the blessing that God has in store for us. God intends to bless us, but we refuse to act in faith. We refuse to do what God has told us to do. And then we, we tie God's hands where he cannot bless us because we are not obedient. Because we do not act in faith. Because without faith, it's an impossible to please God. We have to have faith. We have to operate by faith. The just shall live by faith. You see, it's always, always, always obedience before reward. I want to say that again. It's always obedience before reward. I wonder is there something that you've been holding on to? Something that God may be saying that 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 thing that you have that belongs to me. Or maybe God is saying there's something in your possession that I want to use. Or maybe he's saying I have given you a seed. If you will sow that seed, I will give you back exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you have given to me. I will give you a great, great harvest. If that's you today, if God is talking to you, release that thing that God is talking to you about. Give it over to him that he may release his blessing on you. But be sure that it's God that is telling you. Be sure that it's God that is talking to you that's telling you, the thing that you have, I want to use. Because know this, you cannot outgive God. It's always obedience before reward. The scripture says that Elijah stayed with them for many days, but then he moved on. You see, sometimes we stay camped out in yesterday's blessings. We think that it's no way that God can top this, what we're experiencing right now. So we try to stay camped out on this mountaintop. We say, oh, it just doesn't get any better than this. You see, Elijah was just experiencing a great thing. He was there by the brook, and, and he was drinking from the brook. He was being fed. Now, God said, move on now. Move on from that blessing. I'm going to bless you somewhere else. Now, if Elijah had tried to stay camped out in that blessing, he would have missed the blessing that God had for him that he went over to Seraphath to get. So God does, wants to do new things for us, you see. But sometimes we stay camped out in the old things, and we miss the new things. We keep flogging that dead horse. We keep going back to the well that has long since run dry. Yet we try to perpetuate the blessings that have long since ran out. God is waiting for us to get over the awe of the old so that we can take hold of the new. Look at Isaiah chapter 43 verse 19. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? We talk about what God did for us years ago, or what God did for our parents, or what God did for our grandparents. We even talk about what God did for those people in Scripture. But this is what Scripture says, Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Remember God's blessings. Just, just like His mercies, they are renewed every single day. God says that, Every morning, his mercies are renewed. Well, every day, God wants to bestow a blessing upon you. He wants to bestow a blessing upon your family. He wants to bestow a blessing upon your loved ones. He wants to bless you. God is a good, good God. He's a good, good father. He, he, he will not leave us. He will not forsake us. He wants us to be obedient, and then he will bless us. It's always obedience before reward. Now, I want you to, to, to remember this, that we don't live 
in yesterday's blessings. But yes, we do remember yesterday's blessings because we are encouraged by yesterday's blessings. We remember that if God did it then, he will do it for us now. We remember that, that it's according to his riches and glory that he supplies all of our needs, not out of his riches and glory. You see, his bank accounts don't run dry. His storehouses never run short, and neither does his supply chain ever run out. God does not go bankrupt. He will supply our needs no matter what the circumstances are. God is a God of over and beyond. God has an abundance of things. His streets are made of gold. His gates are one single pearl. God has an abundance. He's not filing bankruptcy. He's not filing chapter 13. I want you to understand this as well. If God uses you, or if God uses your things, He will repay you. He will repay you for the use of whatever it is that He has used. But sometimes I say, no, Brother Kenny. Not always. Not in all circumstances. Yes, in every single circumstance, God will give back to you what you have given, and even more so. I want you to look at this. Luke chapter 5, verse 1 through 7. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gisaneret and saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when he had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. Peter was like, been there, done that. There are no fish out there, Jesus. But Jesus insisted. He said, look, Peter, I used your boat. Now I want to pay you back for using your boat. Think of it as a rental fee. And the part that you mentioned about there being no fish out there, who made the fish in the first place? Who supplied the seas and the oceans with their abundant bounty? That's right, I did. So can I not do the small thing? Can I not supply fish for your nets? Can I not give you back exceedingly, abundantly, above that which you can ask or even think? God does not use our stuff without paying us for its use. Neither does he let little remain small when you give it over to him. Always remember, little is much in the hands of God. So in closing, I want to say, God does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's always, always the same. If he did it back then, he will do it now. If he did it for them, he'll do it for you. Remember that God desires to bless you. He desires to bless you exceedingly, abundantly, above that which you can ask or even think. But remember, it's always obedience before reward. You will not be rewarded for disobedience. You will not be rewarded for holding back. You will not re be rewarded for keeping your fists closed when God say, open your hand. So if you would like to know that kind of blessing today, if you would like to know a God like that, a God who loves you, a God who cares for you, a God who came down himself, he didn't send somebody else, he didn't send an angel, he didn't send a human, he came himself and he paid the price. For you when he hung on Calvary. If you would like to know that God, if you would like to know that Jesus, 
Would you pray that prayer with me? Pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Help me to be obedient to you. Help me to be faithful in all that you tell me to do. Help me to live my life for you. Help me to hear your voice and to distinguish your voice from the other no voices and the other noise that's in the world. That I might know you. That I might be obedient. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I suggest that you do is to buy a Bible. Read that Bible every single day. Get a highlighter and you highlight the verses that are meaningful to you. Those verses that will help you when you're feeling down, when you're feeling uh, discouraged. Highlight those verses that will help you through temptation. That you might live a faithful life to Jesus. Because remember, it's the just that walks by faith and not by sight. Find yourself a Bible-believing church. Not one of those progressive churches that embraces the world and the things of the world that tells you you can live any way you want because God loves everybody. Well, God might love everybody, but He desires and He, he commands for us to live a certain way, a right way. There's a right way and there's a wrong way. And God says, there's a right way, walk ye in it. Join that type of church, the church that, that, that believes that there's a right way to live, but also the church believes that there's still power in the name of Jesus, that God still do miracles. There's some churches that, that say, yes, there's a right way to live, but there's no power. God has lost his potency. No, join a church that believes in the power of the word of God. Believe them. Be discipled in that church. And when Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is that you should be doing and what he's called you to do. And he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now enter into the joy of the Lord. I want to say thank you so much for joining us. And I, I'm always amazed when we see all the people that, that, that log in to watch us and watch our, our, our videos. We appreciate you so much. The Lord bless you. We pray for you. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.